would be an interesting, engaging way to start our conference morning. So, uh, Serena, I'll turn it over to you. I don't want to cut into your time. You've got a half an hour to show us a lot of really cool stuff. So, good morning, Serena. Hi there, good morning, everyone. And thank you for allowing me this opportunity to come to you. So I am Serene Greenway, and just as Kathy shared, I am a Family and Consumer Sciences Extension Educator. I'm located in Owyhee County, which is a, a rural county that actually borders the Oregon and Nevada borders in Idaho, so very Southern Idaho. And today I'm gonna to be talking about a program we call Cooking Under Pressure. And all I'm doing is really just sharing the tips, the tricks, the ins and outs of electric pressure cooking. And so I really do appreciate you allowing me to be a part of your Open Spaceless Endless Possibilities Conference. And I hope that as we go throughout this morning, with um, this little window of cooking with me that you maybe pick up some tips and tricks. Maybe you're wondering how you're gonna go through this wonderful full day conference and get dinner on the table. And maybe it'll be taco pasta or just as Kathy mentioned, there are some more recipes that will be in that booklet that you could try out. So we get started, what is pressure cooking? And so some of you may have grown up with a traditional stovetop pressure cooker. That's something I was very familiar with growing up. But all we have done in the modern age is we have taken that stovetop version and it has been adapted to be an electric model. It's its own separate device. And it is still using trap steam, just as the traditional method did. And research does show that it does, re hoping everyone can hear me, but it does retain nutrients at a higher rate than traditional cooking methods. And this is subjective, but a lot of people say that it has stronger flavors. I think that's a personal uh, comparison. And then there is research, research shows that it saves energy compared to other cooking methods as well. When we talk about the parts of an electric pressure cooker, and you may be able to slightly see behind me, I actually have two different brands located behind me, and we'll walk through those at the very end, and I'll show you some of these pieces. But the basic piece is that here in the photo, you can see what is called the inner pot. This is a model that has a stainless steel version. Some of the brands will come with the appliance. You'll have a nonstick version or every brand actually does have it available that you may be able to purchase the opposite. So with that being said, one very popular brand is Instant Pot and most of their brands and model, most of their models will come default with a stainless steel inner pot, but you may purchase an additional non-stick inner pot. Um, Crock Pot brand, for example, typically comes with a default non-stick inner pot. And again, you can purchase from that manufacturer the stainless steel. So depending on your personal preference, you may buy a personal model, but you still have that opportunity to switch out that inner pot, which is great. And if you've ever been familiar with slow cooking and a slow cooking unit has an electrical base, it does have the inner button that decompresses when you have filled the inner pot, or in that case, the crock with your food, it will lower into the base and it will depress that inner button. The same exact uh, situation occurs when we're talking about electric pressure cooking. It's just a slightly different cooking method than that. When we talk about the inner pot, it can be removed to, to wash and we highly recommend that you treat it just as you would any pan, that after each use, you are washing that appropriately. And it is the essential piece for your electric pressure cooker. I've had some clientele tell me that they actually put food in their electric pressure cooker without the inner pot and they did ruin that appliance. So that can occur because again, that is where your food will be contained. So then we have the lid. On the lid, you can see the inner ring or the silicone ring that is important to create that airtight seal because that will build up that steam, which is what we are intending to build up to cook our food. And so it's going to be on the underside of that lid. And to date, I don't know of any models that do not have that inner silicone ring. And we, again, as I'm walking you through these different pieces, we highly encourage you to wash each and every piece as you are cooking every single time. I've had clientele tell me, oh, I didn't know you recommended to wash that 
ceiling ring, or as we're looking at this shield and this float valve, um, I don't wash my lid. I only wash my inner pot. And to be clear, we want to be treating um, our food practices the same, whether we're electric pressure cooking or not. And so we are cooking at a higher temperature than some of our traditional methods, but we still want to make sure we're maintaining that food cleanliness and food handling practices. So when we look at that shield, it's really important to have that harsh part of your lid. Some people have told me I forgot to replace it after washing it and setting it in my drying rack. And it's really crucial because it's going to contribute to um, food not getting trapped in your air vent. And so with that, you could have clogging, you could have bacteria buildup as well. And then you could also, it could lead to a malfunction of your appliance. And so uh, in addition to the shield, that is really important when we talk about foamy or frothy foods and preventing it from getting into the technical pieces of your lid. We also have the floating valve, and that is actually going to lock your lid into place. That is a safety function, and it will um, make it so that you may not remove your lid when you um, have any pressure built up. So in addition, some models, not every single one, but um, they will actually have a condensation cup, and it's really important to clean that out each time as well, as it can be a buildup of excess uh, moisture from the appliance that has been let off through the cooking method. Not every unit contains these, but if you your unit does, it's really important to wash that. So a big thing that I get from clientele is, oh yeah, we bought this for Christmas for my mom, or I got it for a Mother's Day present, and I just don't know how to use it. Well, the beauty of these electric pressure cookers is they have pre-built in functions. And by that, as you're looking at this photo, so this in the photo is an Instant Pot brand, and it has a, a function preset for soup, meats or stews, beans or chili, poultry. There are a lot of units that have a slow cook function or saute, which is something that as we talk about the taco pasta recipe for today, that will be the saute function that we can use to brown that ground beef. You have manual um, buttons, you have rice. So there's all these preset but, uh, functions. Not every unit is going to have the same one. So even among Instant Pot, that brand has, I think at last count, they had over 17 different models. And so it's great to know that there is a lot of availability on the market, but please know that if you don't have anything specific that you're hoping to cook in this appliance, an example of that would be yogurt. If you have no interest in cooking yogurt, the actual functions that are preset on your appliance really don't matter. And I know you're going to say, but wait, I'm going to want that one that's going to have the exact rice setting for me. Well, please note, just as you can see that finger in the photo, it's showing you that there is a manual button where you are going to be able to adjust some pressure. You're going to be able to adjust time as well. And so with that, it doesn't really matter which unit, which brand you have, as long as you start to familiarize yourself with your brand and start to know what the settings can do. So as you're seeing here, some units do have a high, a low, or normal setting. Not every unit is going to have that, and that is completely fine. We are seeing that almost every single uh, appliance on the market for an electric pressure cooker does have the keep warm setting. That is something that automatically defaults uh, once you have reached pressure. So with that being said, you have your food in your pressure cooker, you've locked it into place, your electric pressure cooker will take time to get up to the pressure that you are going to be getting to for your recipe. And then it will count down. Once it is done counting down, uh, you will have an audible uh, little uh, detail that tells you, oh, this is ready, I've reached pressure or I'm done cooking. And so you'll know where your appliance is at and you have indicators on the display. As you can see in this photo, there are, there are different display versions, but they're all going to be indicating to you where your appliance is at. And then once you have fully cooked for the set amount of time that you have selected for your recipe, it will then default to the keep warm setting. So it will actually go roughly uh, the same temperature as I keep warm on a slow cooker appliance. When we talk about electric pressure cooking, a lot of people want to know, okay, so how does that translate with the recipe that I'm selecting? Maybe I have a bake recipe that I'm using, and now I would like to convert that to a steam 
pressure cooked recipe. And so you, there are some adaptations that can be made, but um, a lot of people are wanting to know, will I save time in this process? And I really want to share with you as I opened up with that slide, I said, you can save energy. You know, there's research that supports that there's higher nutrient uh, quality in your food, but you didn't hear me talk about time savings. And that's because it can really depend. A lot of people are like, oh, you save so much time with a pressure cooker. And with that being said, you can, doesn't necessarily mean that you will. And the ease is definitely there. So you can definitely save ease. It can be, you can multitask much easier than if you were something stovetop style, uh, such as our taco pasta, as we're going to do this morning. But with that being said, it does take time to build up steam pressure inside your appliance. And so it may not necessarily save you the time to get dinner on the table that you may assume it does. And so here are some other examples of some different foods, you know, porridge and what type of setting would that be? Again, these are in examples where you have the high, normal, low settings, not always the case. And I quite frequently don't adjust my pressure setting, even when I'm using an appliance that has that option available to me, because I'm, I'm just trying to get it, set it and forget it while I'm multi multitasking for something else. And so... Again, there does need to be altitude adjustments. Uh, to be clear, for electric pressure cookers, we have none that Cooperative Extension recommends to use for pressure canning. And so as I talk about these altitude adjustments on this chart here, this is in relation to pressure cooking, not canning, in case we have any canners here with us this morning, thinking that that is what this adjustment is for. And so here in the Treasure Valley, where I am currently located, the um, adjustment, I would um, I would not need to make much of an adjustment. Um, every now and again, I am adding a couple of minutes to something that I am cooking for a relatively long period of time. But otherwise, I am under that 3,000 feet. I don't see a major need to adjust my recipes for my appliance. So a big thing... Serena, if you can hear us, we've uh, lost your audio. You're frozen. Oh, you gotta love Zoom meetings. Pardon? <laughs> you have to love Zoom meetings. <laughs> yes, you do. Such a real sense of urgency. <laughs> I'm ready to hear the rest of the story. Well, darn it. While we're here, maybe everyone can use either the chat or if you go to participants and do a thumbs up if you have a um, electric pressure cooker at home that you use. All right, Serene's back. Oh, excellent. Well, ha hey everyone. Um, <laughs> I hope that was as exciting for you as it was for me. <laughs> um, so I don't know where I left everyone, but I was about to start discussing NR, which is natural release or QR and what that means in your recipe. So when you are following a recipe that says NR, what it is meaning is now your pressure, your recipe, you've gotten your appliance up to pressure. It is cooked for the allotted amount of, allotted amount of time in your recipe. And now it has defaulted to that key form setting. You may have a timer on your display right here that will tell you it may have an indicator such as an L, which is meaning it's at the low, very low setting and it's not referring to a low pressure. It's re relating to that low temperature heat of a key form and it may start to count up. So it'll have an L and it'll go from five to six to seven, letting you know how long that food has been at a key form setting. When you are following a recipe that has really frothy food or it was you had really filled your appliance to the max, which is not to the actual top of your inner pot. Uh, to be clear, it's actually the recommended max fill is actually two thirds of your pot and that's to allow for liquid as well exp as expansion of your food throughout the cooking process. So when you are following a recipe that has an NR, um, sometimes it will tell you, let the pressure naturally dissipate from that recipe. If your entire uh, recipe does need to go through a natural release, 
and you're doing a stew or a soup, that could take 30, 45, even up to an hour, depending on how full your pressure cooker is. Now, with that being said, there are other recipes that may tell you to do natural release for 10 minutes, followed by a quick release method. And what that means is it's going to default to the keep warm setting. You'll see that L if your display shows that, and then it starts counting up after it's counted up to 10 minutes. You're then going to switch your vent port cover, which has been locked into place so that you can build up that steam. And now any remaining steam that's still in there, you're going to let that natural um, release quickly. Some recipes will tell you to just do a quick release. I would just be mindful if you're seeking recipes from, you know, Susie Q's blog. So just an, an unreliable blog out there with great looking information, very appe eye appealing. Just make sure that if it's something like a soup, a stew, a rice, if you had your electric pressure cooker filled up to the max line for your appliance, that you are mindful, oh, it's telling me to do a quick release. But, you know, this is a really frothy, full chili. And so I'd be careful of that and maybe start with a natural release for a period of time and then test my pressure release. Because if you just quickly default it to a quick release, you can get, um, you know, remember that shield that I showed you on the underside, it may not capture all that frothy food and you may end up clogging your vent port and um, actually impacting the appliance itself. So do be mindful of that. So as you see here, the natural release is one type, the quick release is another. Natural release is where you're just letting it release naturally on its own. With a quick, quick release, you are switching that knob. Um, and each knob or valve will look slightly different. Um, please note when you are doing a quick release, it is you are letting built up steam pressure escape from your appliance. So do be mindful. So I have cupboards right here above my um, kitchen space. So while I would love some new cupboards, my husband tells me this is not the way to get it. So be mindful of that steam. You can definitely have some warping of your cupboards, um, some issues with that. So you want to make sure you're pulling that base, the appliance base out from under cupboards and that you're going to be able to have free flowing steam, especially if you're doing that quick release. I always, when I'm teaching students how to use electric pressure cookers, I'm actually telling them to use you know, a spatula or use some type of kitchen utensil so they can stand a few feet away and they can move that knob with that utensil. So reducing that risk that you're going to have some steam burns. And so when we talk about which foods are best for a quick release, so delicate foods or vegetables, and then again, be weary of those starchy foods. Um, and those are more for a natural release. Again, even after you have completely removed the steam pressure from your appliance, and your um, floating valve, which locks that lid into place. And remember, I told you that was a safety function, making sure that you cannot unlock that lid while there is built up steam. Even after that floating valve or that locking pin will reduce and you can open up your lid, you still wanna practice that safety. Remember, it is built up steam that has been cooking for quite a while. So you wanna make sure you're opening that lid away from yourself, no matter how bad you wanna tilt your head in and get a whiff of what it, it smells like in there. Um, when we talk about these appliances, so when I said set it and forget it, I said set it and forget it while I am multitasking in my kitchen. So please know we never recommend that you set your electric pressure cooker and leave your home. And this is for safety purposes. Again, we there is another concern that individuals are trying to use their electric pressure cookers as a deep fryer. We again do not recommend that. There's there was one model on the market that I think they did remove that recommendation um, because I no longer have seen that from when I checked a couple of years ago. So to date, we have no recommendations for you to use it as a fire. And so here you can see an inner pot. And I told you that there is actually a max fill and it does not uh, match up with the inner pot. So here I have a non-stick inner pot as an example, and I have, just as there are markings on this photo, I have a different max fills, but please note that we recommend two-thirds way full as your maximum when you are pressure cooking. That is one thing that people think, well, there's a higher max. Well, you may be putting something in to slow cook or to saute, and you are never putting it under that steam pressure, and so you can use your inner pot at different levels. 
But when we are talking about a max fill to undergo steam pressure, please know that this is a safety um, recommendation as well as quality as if you overfill your inner pot, it can um, alter your appliance because you can have issues with leaking of that built up pressure. And so you can end up having to replace the appliance, which they can be costly. So again, please note that we recommend that you clean your appliance each and every time, both the inner pot as well as all of the lid pieces. A lot of the manufacturer's manuals will tell you that your lid pieces, the inner ring, the float valve, the um, all of the shield, all of those pieces are dishwasher safe, top rack only, um, including the lid. I hand wash mine. I don't have a problem um, washing it very quickly, but you may um, want to um, be considering that, you know, if you're in a hurry, you can put those on the top shelf of your dish rack. And then right here is an example of cleaning the actual base. So please note that the base of the electric pressure cooker, just as a slow cooker, it is electrical. So we don't recommend washing any of these pieces, but we do want to still maintain cleanliness. And so in this photo, you can actually see using a sponge to clean that outer area that can be hard to get through with a washcloth. And we, you're just dampening that um, sponge slightly so that you may be able to clean in those crevices. The inner pot, remember there are stainless steel. In my, in my case, I have a non-stick version for one of my brands as I have a couple of brands personally. And um, you just wanna make sure that anything that you have used, even if it's a rack that you have used in the cooking process that you are cleaning that each and every time and that you wanna make sure you're cleaning all of the pieces, not just some of them. Over time, you can actually get a build up of some um, residue from cooking your foods over time. And you can easily remove those um, hard stains, if you will, with a with some vinegar and putting it under a pressure cook. So please note, you wanna make sure that you do have liquid in there um, because we are using steam pressure for that to take place. But you can even see a difference um, from you know several uses and some, some bluing, some, some residue as um, followed by a clean with some white vinegar. And then again, that lid is dishwasher safe. You do wanna store it once you're done cleaning upright because we don't wanna lock it into place and hold it in some odors that can occur over time. And then again, you wanna clean all of these pieces. They are removable. You can push up and you're washing them. You're wanting them to air dry before you are placing them back. You don't wanna place any of these pieces while they are still damp. And then the ceiling ring, this is a really big one that students love and they say, oh my gosh, I can smell what you cooked last. So remember these appliances are intended to build up steam pressure and they wanna do so as adequately as they can so that it's efficient. And so when you are using these, you may find that your ceiling ring has taken on an odor. I find that by washing it in the top rack of the dishwasher, it helps eliminate that. A different recommendation is you can purchase an additional ceiling ring. You can use one for sweet foods, one for savory, because I definitely don't want my rice pudding um, to have a, a hint of my chicken fiesta that I did in there, some soup. Um, again, cleaning is important because we've had clientele show us some pictures over time and, oh, look, I wasn't cleaning my condensation collector and mold growth occurred. So this is the, the yuck side that we don't wanna see and it's easily preventable by cleaning all pieces of our appliance. As I mentioned, canning in electric pressure cookers is not recommended. The most recent um, brand on the market that does have claims for this as we've had multiple over the last several years is Presto brand. I just wanna to share to date, Cooperative Extension does not have any material, any research that supports that. We've had a lot of clientele reaching out regarding the Presto brand uh, and the specific model that states it is intended for canning. And I just wanna share with you, that I have no research for that, so I cannot recommend that. So in the photo you see here, that is a traditional stovetop pressure canner, and that is what is intended to use for pressure canning. And so with that, if you have any questions, if you wanna pop those into the chat, you may do so, but I was going to walk you through with just a couple more minutes, some of these pieces so that you can understand 
that with your appliance, there is the lid, there is a sealing ring. This is not a an instant. Oh, this is my instant pot brand. Just kidding. So this is the instant pot brand, the sealing ring, the floating valve, my shield. Here is a valve lock. Some of these you'll realize um, if you do have one, that they can be very difficult to read when your valve is locked into place. I do have a separate model that actually has a knob where I'm not switching my valve. I'm actually just pushing a knob. It's a completely different version. But when I am trying to lock my lid into place, I do have a nicer indicator than I do with my other brand where I don't, um, I keep having to mark this brand, but after use and washing it and keeping that appliance clean, it wipes away my mark. So this is something that's really nice from the appliance. When you are pressure cooking, you may need additional pieces of equipment so that you can conduct all of your recipes. An example is you do have in that recipe packet an egg bite recipe, and that does require an additional mold. And so by a mold, I mean to actually put your egg bites in. It come, um, you may order these online. They don't need to be brand specific. A lot of times I find that the brands do carry their own accessory kits so that it comes with a wrap, it comes with a mold, and these go are intended to be, they're called pot in pot cooking, and that's where you have your inner pot, you have your water, because remember, you always wanna have water in the appliance because that is what is going to cook that food in there. You place your wrap in there, you place your mold of what you're cooking, and it's you now have a barrier between the bottom of your appliance inner pot and your food. So this is something I love making those egg bites that I shared a recipe for. Great way to get uh, younger individuals in the household to consume those veggies that you can hide into that recipe. As you look at the taco pasta recipe, so that's something you can do stovetop style if you don't have an electric pressure cooker. So I know it's gonna be a long day, but say you're wanting to make sure you get that food on fast, you could make that recipe all at the end of today, even as you're uh, all getting together for your social hour and playing those games together. You could be using your electric pressure cooker to brown your meat, add your ingredients, let it pressure cook, add some cheese, let it warm up and melt that cheese and get it on the table. Or you could, during your breaks, I know you have a few breaks this, throughout the day. I have my ground beef, it is thawed. I can go ahead and put it in my inner pot. I can put my pressure cooking setting on saute, brown that ground beef up. I can remove that fat if you wanna remove, if you have a higher fat uh, cut of ground beef. And then you can pop it in the fridge until later today. So if you're wanting to do the steps throughout the day, you could at least ground your ground meat this morning during a break. But remember, you do wanna then store that uh, cooked ground beef in the refrigerator, pull it out when you're adding the rest of the ingredients this afternoon. So with that, I'm going to uh, leave the last couple of minutes open to any questions. So. So the recipes, Tammy, are on the main program site. If you pee, okay, and Melinda actually put those in. And then it sounds like Tammy um, has a very nice electric pressure version and the brand is Ninja. And so that's a really popular one. Um, great, we've got Juliet, who's an electric pressure cooker. Okay, Emily, yes, please do. Um, that's been a lifesaver is using those little craft sponges. And then yes, um, different rings if you're quite the avid cooker. And yes, sometimes when you forget to put that ceiling ring, um, you'll know because it won't build up pressure for you. And then Tammy says, and so, well, with that, Tammy, you you have that recipe. You can easily ground that ground beef. It's a very simple recipe. I've done it with third graders. And so I know all of you professionals attending the NAP conference today of no problem reading right through that. It's a very simple recipe created by Kathy Tipson and I and my colleague, Amy Robertson, located in Northern Idaho. So thank you, Michael. How much water do you generally use for egg bites? I recommend one cup. And so you, some recipes you can get away with half a cup of liquid. I recommend defaulting doing one cup and then you don't run into any issues. Sometimes 
um, the recipe is accommodating for the liquid or moisture naturally present in the food you're cooking. But if you just think one cup at a minimum, you won't run into any troubles, any burn notices or ruining that appliance. Well, thank you everyone. Thank you, I'm sorry I didn't cook with you, Tammy. <laughs> thank you so much, Serene. And thank that, you. That information for the, um, is, there's a link in here for that information for the recipe booklet, and there's Serene's contact information is there also if you have more questions. Thank you so much for starting us off this morning, Serene. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Serene. You guys have a great conference. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We have about four minutes left. And so Kathy is going to lead us through the oh. Idaho's um, five for five curriculum. I'm not sure we have a total of five minutes for it, but Kathy, if you want to tell us what that curriculum is really quick and lead us through an activity or two. Yeah, thank you. And just very quickly, Idaho is um, piloting, um, part of the health and wellness team is piloting a, uh, an add-on physical activity curriculum. So it's just something that they've been uh, sort of doing intuitively <laughs> during some of our longer Zoom meetings, just throwing in some physical activity breaks. So they decided to put together a curriculum of some of the stuff they've been doing already. So the idea is to hit five different areas in five minutes. So they're calling it five for five, five minutes to better health. And I'm gonna try not to giggle because I'm not known for my physical prowess, but I did say I would help pilot this curriculum. Um, so I, I am reading to you, I apologize for that. This isn't my background area, but I do wanna share this with you because it's pretty cool. The areas that their curriculum um, hits are mindfulness, cardiovascular endurance, muscular endurance and bone strengthening, muscular strength and flexibility and balance. And the overall goal is just to increase the amount of physical activity for people of all ages. And again, this is just a five minute add, add on that they're really asking people who aren't necessarily in our, our area, family consumer sciences, they're asking other educators to please use this, you know, um, our uh, agriculture people out on field trips and whatever, and whatever other areas, 4-H, get everybody involved in, in doing this. I have had some experience doing this with 4-H and they seem to enjoy it. Um, <laughs> again, me, me leading physical activity makes me giggle a little, but what I'd like uh, to ask you to do is let's just do a little mindfulness as we get ready to head into uh, the morning and listening to sessions. And I'm just gonna ask you just sitting in your seat comfortably and just kind of wiggle around and get comfortable if you wouldn't mind. And placing um, your hand on your abdomen comfortably. We're just gonna do some deep breaths. And um, this is just called contemplative breathing, one version of that. So I'm just gonna ask you to take a deep breath in. And as you do that, just kind of feel your hand on your stomach and feel your air moving through your body. So let's do that together. And then release. Do that again and just feel the air going in and coming out. One more slow breath in. Thank you. And that's just one example. And so I wanted to share something like that with you this morning and just as a um, a little commercial for tomorrow morning, Jen, who's on here, Jennifer Werland, is going to be teaching a yoga class tomorrow morning. So we'll get to learn a lot more about that kind of uh, contemplative breathing. Um, that's what I had, Julie, unless you wanted me to stand up and do something else. But I, I, I think that's probably good. Uh, this will give people one minute to take a quick break if they need to before the, the next session starts or the conference officially kicks off. Thank you all for joining us. For those who came for the cooking with Serene, we hope you get a chance to put everything together and have dinner on the table easily tonight. And thank you for joining us for NACD Up Connects. And I hope you got a chance to meet some people you may not have otherwise, and hopefully a little closer to what a real in-person conference experience would be like. Well, we only have about 15 minutes for our uh, plenary kickoff this morning, so I don't want to uh, wait too long to uh, welcome everybody. It's, uh, it's pretty awesome to see so many familiar faces on this Zoom call. Um, I think we forget sometimes how many people we actually know uh, who do similar work to us and who are part of NACDEP across the country. We don't always 
see each other uh, in programs or other organizations. And uh, it's just great to see so many people. Um, and for those of you who are new to NACDEP, um, this will be the same way for you uh, the longer you uh, are a member um, and, and see all these familiar faces. So, so good morning um, and welcome to the 2021 uh, virtual NACDEP conference. Um, I'm the current president, uh, Adam Hodges. Uh, I'm an extension agent for West Virginia State University uh, Extension Service. I do community and economic development as a county agent. Um, and I'm your president, uh, at least until Tuesday, uh, when Melinda Grismer is going to take over uh, that role. And uh, I hope you're looking forward to this opportunity for us to get together and to network and to learn um, and have the camaraderie that we share um, in, in, a, in a regular conference uh, in a virtual world. Um, I think last year we kind of set the bar for what a virtual conference could be, um, and I, I, have, I have all hope that uh, our current conference team uh, is going to excel beyond that. Um, so we've got a th busy three days ahead of us, um, and I want to make sure we can kind of get things started here and, and get to our first sessions. So without further ado, uh, here's conference co-chair Katie Hoffman from the University of Idaho who's been hard at work putting together the program that you're gonna experience for the next three days. So welcome and enjoy the conference. Thank you, Adam. And I'm going to be brief as well because we have a day full of great content and you don't really need to just listen to me all day. Um, hopefully you're all finding Oxford easy to navigate. Um, we're pretty happy with how the final product turned out. So you should be able to just continue clicking through the schedule and connecting to your links. I'm excited to see you all here. I'm very disappointed that we aren't in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho right now, but we are looking forward to seeing you guys in Coeur d'Alene in 2023. So I appreciate you guys supporting our virtual conference again this year. And I just wanna say thank you to my co-chairs, Melinda Grismer and Mike Gaffney. They've been also hard at work and currently still hard at work. And we have our tech liaisons going on today. It's Brian Raisin and Jan Steen, as well as Melinda, Mike and myself. So again, if you have questions, you can contact one of us and we should be able to help you out. And I just wanna give a shout out to my committee because they have made the transition from full steam ahead to an in-person conference to um, slamming on the brakes and a 180 to virtual. So I really appreciate all their hard work and their willingness and uh, willingness to stay on for 2023. So we get to do a double duty for you guys and we're excited about that. But our committees, we have um, our Carrie Boone, she's our speaker chair, Jill Coffer, Juliet Daniels, she's our hospitality chair, uh, Colette DePhelps, Jim Eakins, he's our mobile workshop chair, um, although you don't get to experience his work this year, hopefully you will later. Uh, Jody Gale, Melissa Hamilton, she's our finance chair. Lori Higgins, Tamara Oval, Chris Parker, Rebecca Saros, and she is our chair sessions. Um, Jan Steen and Gwen Stewart are our co-chairs for marketing and Kathy Tift and Jennifer, Jennifer Worlin. And so I just wanna give a big virtual shout out to those guys for all their hard work. Welcome to the conference. I hope you enjoy our virtual format and let us know if you have any questions. Welcome to 2021. I guess I'll take it from here. Hi, I'm John Phillips. I'm uh, uh, representing the 1994s with NACDEP. Uh, thanks, Katie, for that introduction. And I'm pleased to facilitate our land acknowledgement. Um, in more normal times, as Katie mentioned, we'd all be sitting together in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and we would acknowledge the indigenous lands as represented by the descendants of the modern Coeur d'Alene tribe. Yeah but we are in a virtual world and are all in different places. So I'd ask you to reflect on your place and the indigenous lands that you inhabit. Uh, for me, I am sitting on native lands in Athens, Georgia. Georgia once had at least five different native tribes occupy, occupying and nurturing this land, all of which were removed. athens Clark County is located on land belonging originally to the Creek Indians. Each of us has an indigenous land history to acknowledge, and I would encourage each of you to reflect upon that as we get started and to learn more about the indigenous history of your place. 
Um, we wanted to share an example of how one land grant university acknowledges the indigenous lands that they inhabit. This is a short video from Colorado State University, and it might give you some ideas of how your institution and your programs could do something similar. So let me share my screen. Thank you. Colorado State University acknowledges with respect that the land we are on today is a traditional and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations and peoples. This was also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for numerous other native nations. We recognize the indigenous peoples as original stewards of this land and all the relatives within it. As these words of acknowledgement are spoken and heard, the ties nations have to their traditional homelands are renewed and reaffirmed. CSU is a land-grant institution, and we accept that our mission must encompass access to education and inclusion. And significantly, that our founding came at a dire cost to Native nations and peoples whose land this university was built upon. This acknowledgement is the education and inclusion we must practice in recognizing our institutional history, responsibility, and commitment. Okay, so um, that just uh, hopefully gave you an idea of what you might do um, in your work. Um, land acknowledgements are important and a good start, but they are not enough. And um, to speak more about that, I'd like to turn it over to Emily Proctor from Michigan State University. Chima uh, Gletch, John, and Bajou, everyone, welcome. And so to dive deeper into the land acknowledgement piece, uh, when we know that we all sit in institutions that are part of, that sit on tribal land, it's important to know why we engage in these conversations. Why would we pursue a land acknowledgement? So it's important to think about intent. It's important to think about who is at the table when it comes to creating land acknowledgements. And it's also important to think about that how those relationships occur from the university to tribal nations and tribal communities. How has that relationship been built? How are you continuing to build and honor that? And how are we continuing to support sovereignty? So when thinking about land acknowledgements, recognizing that tribes are continuing to heal, continuing to grapple with the long-term repercussions of federal policy from, a la from um, land allotments to removal to um, boarding schools, historical trauma. So when entering into these conversations, please keep in mind your intention and the so what factor. You are creating a land acknowledgement. What's the end result? What is the benefit for tribal nations? How can we support them and the work that they do and their communities? So uh, we've created a resource list for you that we have will share with you. And please um, explore those, re those resources Contact your tribal communities, tribal nations near you. Um, when you work with tribal communities and nations, think of ways to support their work. How can we honor their time and effort? And again, thinking about your intention. What is the so what factor to a land acknowledgement? There's so much more, right? You may say, you may create, but then what? Always think about the next step and how you can create 
that longstanding trusting relationship and continue to rebuild um, a lot of those very difficult conversations and um, situations that have occurred as a result of the exchange of lands. So Chima Gwach for having us and um, let us know if you have any questions here or in the future. Thank you so much, John and Emily. We just dropped um, resources that Emily has created for us so that we can reference them. They're in our Google Drive and we had trouble with the first link, but we just, um, another one, so hopefully it works for you. We will also um, embed it in the program for this particular section. So look back there if you don't get it before we're able to jump off into concurrent sessions. But thank you very much for that. That means a lot to us. With that, I'd say that's the end of our uh, morning plenary. Um, enjoy the day, uh, enjoy the camaraderie, reach out to other NAC Deppers. Uh, if you see something that you like, or you see somebody who you think might be a good colleague to work with on something, um, we are a big family as, uh, as my family here knows. Um, and so uh, enjoy the day. <laughs>